All right, folks, uh, good morning. We started recording on the lecture for chapter three, which is how to code and test a Windows form application. There's, um, again, just some fundamentals working with graphical forms. Um, and so in this class, we do both. We work with forms and we work with uh, council applications, which you could you know, we call the command line interface, CLI. So, um, again, the book is a little bit more focused on the, on the forms. And so, what we're going to do is, uh, you know, work with these graphical interfaces. I think last chapter, if you listened to or watched the lecture, like, uh, we made this, but we really did not do much with it. And so we're going to continue to make this uh, application and talk about the different pieces and all the terminology behind it. Um, and so kind of start off here in Visual Studio, open up a new instance here, Visual Studio 2019 Community. And I've already created a, have I created a chapter three? See, here's a chapter three solution that I've already created. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on that since this is chapter three. Um, okay, I must have moved it. So let me see, since I've moved it, so what I did was, let me explain this. Chapter three solution, it was on my desktop. Okay, my repository was on my desktop, but since then I've moved it. My repository has moved, it's no longer on my desktop. It's now right here. C Sharp Coursework EA Gudmestead, which is a subfolder. Here's the full path. It's on my desktop, and now I've got this Spring 21 C Sharp repos. And then this is my repository here, and I go Lab Chapter 3, and there's my Chapter 3 solution. And so, uh, since I moved my repository, Visual Studio didn't didn't know that. And so when I clicked on this, it said, eh, "I can't find it." Um, do you want to remove it from the recent? Yeah, sure, because it's it's not working anymore. Um, you can alternatively uh, go into the path where you know it's at and just open up the solution file. Okay, again, repeating what I said last week, a solution contains multiple projects. Here's one, two, three projects. And you can even see the, the file extension is CS for C Sharp proj for project and so each one of these lab folders has a cs proj and you could open these up individually but i never do i just open up the solution so you open up the solution file and it's going to open up all of the projects Okay, projects loaded and ready to use. Background tasks are running. Okay, that's great. Now, right away, um, very commonly, you know, students open this up and they go, wait a minute, nothing's here. Where, where's my work? You know, I opened up my solution and it's not there. The window that you're looking for is called Solution Explorer. Okay, and it can kind of hide over here in this tab. Um, and so you can just open it up and if you want it to stay there you click on this little pin this little pin will kind of stick it there and now I've got my get changes so this is another window that's kind of like popping in my face I want to get rid of it here so I'm gonna tell this get changes to dock over to the side no I don't want it there I want to see if I can get it there we go so now I've got Solution Explorer and Get Changes. So you can kind of see how you can drag and drop windows and move things around. If you accidentally close Solution Explorer, let me accidentally close it. Oops, I don't know where it went. Oh, accidentally close Get Changes. We can click on View, and here's Solution Explorer. View, Get Changes, and you'll notice they kind of go back to their default positions. If you screwed up so bad, you accidentally like move everything around and nothing's where you want it to be. Click on window, reset window layout. Are you sure you want to reset it and just click yes? 
And this is kind of going to go back to default. Okay, um, and so that's that's fine if you if you really um, move things around to the point where you don't know where anything is anymore. So lab three kind of looks empty. Lab two says hello world. Lab one is a council application. So really neither lab one, lab two, or lab three have any uh, um, this calculator in it that was like, a, I think it was called the invoice total. If I go back to here, I can, they don't have my invoice total. So we'll kind of, we'll kind of rebuild that real quick. It won't take long. Um, so this, this chapter uh, starts off with some terminology. Okay, and these are, these terms are part of the object-oriented programming, we call it paradigm. So classes and objects, there's something called object-oriented programming. Okay, object-oriented programming, as I said before, is a style of coding okay there are other styles okay there's one called procedural programming okay that's um, older than OOP um, and then there's functional and functional programming is I don't know if it's older but it's, it is something that is currently used. Um, another style in use today. Okay, I know that's hard to read. That's not necessarily part of the class. We are not studying either functional programming or procedural programming. I just wanted to kind of talk to them because I, I consider it like studying martial arts and I've never studied martial arts, but I know when you study martial arts, there's like all these styles of martial arts, jujitsu and... Uh, and uh, I know there's a bunch of styles, okay? And you can study the, like the more of the wrestling style of martial arts or more of like the, you know, use their own force against them style of martial arts or the aggressive martial arts or the, you know, you know the Jackie Chan style or, or you know, whatever, whatever the different styles of martial arts are. That's not really the point of this. The point of this is saying that object-oriented is... A, is a style um, and uh, I got a question here in Discord is the written test our attendance today? No, we are going to be doing some work together after the lecture and you're going to be turning in some other work to me on Inside Rankin um, so for today uh, you just have to stick around till after the lecture and we'll be doing some work together that will be your attendance okay now, object-oriented programming is a style of coding, um, and, and these are terms, when you look at these terms, such as object and class and instance, okay, these are object-oriented programming terms um, that, are, that are found regardless, okay, for example, another OOP language is Java, okay? Now, just a reminder, Java is different than JavaScript, but Java is an object-oriented programming language as well, just like C-sharp. Uh, in fact, C-sharp was, in many ways, modeled after Java. And so they took the things that they liked from Java, they took the things that they liked from C++, and it's like those two languages, Java and C++, had a child, and that child was C-sharp. Okay, that's, that's where C-sharp kind of came from. They took what they liked and what they didn't like. They merged the two languages. Out comes C-sharp. Okay, so these terms are, are in different OOP languages, and so it's not unique to C-sharp. Um, the first term that I'm going to cover here is the second bullet called a class. Okay, now uh, a class... I, here's what I think of when I think of a class. 
all right? And, and this is an easy way to remember what a class is, okay? Think of a cookie cutter, all right? If you can think of a cookie cutter, uh, you, you will understand what a class is because what is a cookie cutter? A cookie cutter uh, is, is essentially a template a template for a cookie, right? You could, you could see here, you can think of a class as a template for an object. Okay, so the cookie cutter is your class. The cookie cutter is the template. Okay, so when we create a class, we are creating the cookie cutter. All right, so the class is the cookie cutter. It is our template. The object is whenever you use the cookie cutter, what results is the cookie. So if the class is the cookie cutter, the cookie itself is the object. Okay, now it's like, okay, I can get that. I can, you know, that's, that's the beginning to understand that, but it's like, okay, how does this really work? Okay. In, in coding, in C Sharp, and I'll, I'll hold up on my camera, right? I got my cell phone, right? If I wanted to represent this cell phone in code, right? If I wanted to say, okay, I got to create something that represents a cell phone in C Sharp, okay? you would create a cell phone class. You would create a blueprint for a cell phone. Okay, you would create the template for a cell phone. Okay, then anytime you use that class template, what you do is you create an instance of a class which will create the object and is called instantiation. Okay, so you create an instance of the class. In other words, okay, you, you use an instance of your cookie cutter. You have an instance of the cookie cutter. It's like you're, you're actually stamping down the cookie cutter to create a single instance of a cookie, right? That instance of a cookie is your object. Okay, the more times you reuse that cookie cutter, the more objects you have. Okay, so that's the terms. A class is the blueprint. When you create an instance of the class, you create what's called an object. And, and those are the terms. Okay, now let's put that a little bit to use here. Okay. So, you know, in practical, like, just don't tell me these terms, like, how does this actually work? Okay, I'm going to create a class. So a class is an actual thing in C Sharp. And in, 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 in reality, folks, you won't be creating classes uh, for several chapters. All right, I'm going to create a class called cell phone. I'm going to mark it as public. And um, um, so this is a form. Uh, bu 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 um. uh, okay, so when my cell phone rings in my software, um, it's going to what, what kind of uh, plays. Uh, what kind of cheesy ringtone do we want to say, Rihanna? Okay, so when, when my cell phone rings, okay, I don't know if I spelled Rihanna right, but okay, that's 
that's what my cell phone's going to do. Okay, so my cell phone class, it has the ability to ring, and when it rings, it plays Rihanna music. So I've created a class called cell phone, okay? So what is this? The class is the blueprint. Class is the blueprint for the object, AKA the cookie cutter. Okay, so again, we're kind of getting ahead of really, we don't need to dive so deep into this, but, but we are. Okay, now um, let's go ahead and put a button here. And when we click this button, this button will say ring the cell phone. All right, and when we ring the cell phone, we're going to output this label has no text. We're going to call this label label re, uh, label result LBL result. Okay. Uh, this button does not have a name. I'll call this button ring. All right, when I double click the ring, you can see this is the code that's going to run when I when I click the button. Now my class is called cell phone as such. To create an object aka uh, create an instance of the cell phone class. Okay, this is the code to do that. This is the code to create an object. Again, we're going a little bit deeper than needed here. Don't let this code intimidate you, okay? But this is cell phone my cell equals new cell phone, okay? Don't worry about all of this right now. Line 24 creates an object, okay? The object is a cell phone. The identifier that we talked about identifiers yesterday, the identifier is called my cell. So this is like this is like the cookie, right? This is the cookie cutter. The class is the cookie cutter. But whenever we go to use the cookie cutter right here, we're using the cookie cutter, cell phone, we're creating one called my cell. Okay? Is a new instance of the cell phone class. Label result.text equals my cell dot you can see it has a ring method all right so my cell is the identifier ring is the method that we wrote over here that's going to say it plays rihanna music and that's going to put that in the label if i run this this is just giving you an example plays Rihanna music. Okay. So that's a lot of that's a lot of code to just get it to say plays Rihanna music, but more importantly, we created a cell phone class. We created an instance of the cell phone class and we used it. Now, what's the benefit here? Well, we can create, you know, if, if there's one cell phone in in all of your program, that's fine, but maybe there's more than one. So now we've created two instances, and that's the benefit of creating a class. Benefit of creating classes is that they are reusable. So I could create a thousand cell phones that belong to different people, and they have different ringtones, and they, uh, you know, they have different prices, and you know different screen dimensions and things like that okay we would have to expand our blueprint though right so our blueprints pretty basic right now um, but you can do a lot more over here that makes these cell phones like more uh, usable right so that's some of the terms classes objects and instances right you create an instance of a class 
to create your object. This is a new instance of the cell phone class to create an object called my cell. This object is called your cell. Now, classes, classes have what are called members. Okay, so if I go back to my class here, I'm gonna go inside of my class. You could see line 12 through 17. That's everything inside of my class. Classes have members, okay? Members are one of three things. They are methods, properties, or events. We're gonna focus on methods and properties. But just so you know, when you see the word members, members are just things that belong to the class. Okay, lots of new terms here. Okay, members, a member simply means a method, a property, or an event. A method is like line 18. This is a method. A method has an identifier. Okay, notice my identifier was not camel casing like our variables. Remember yesterday, all of our variables were camel cased, right? Our method started with a capital letter. Okay, so our naming conventions for our methods are Pascal casing. Okay, method has an identifier. This identifier is ring. A method had, also has parentheses. Okay, notice ring has a set of parentheses, um, but what is a method? A method is a behavior of the class. In other words, a cell phone is the class, and what can a cell phone do? what the class can do, okay? This is the behavior of the class. A cell phone can ring. All right, so that's, that. a method is one member of a class. All right, another class, uh, a member, another class member is a property. Okay, now Visual Studio is pretty fancy. If you type in the word prop for property and hit tab twice, we're gonna learn we're gonna learn a lot more about methods. We're gonna learn a lot more about properties. Don't don't let the coding right now intimidate you because we haven't learned any of the coding. I'm just showing you, you know these terms in, in practice, okay? You don't have to do this until we learn about these different pieces in more detail, okay? Now, um, a property is, is just like, if a method is what the class can do, a property is a piece of data about the class. Is a, a property is a piece of data about the class. So when I'm thinking about uh, a cell phone, uh, well, like manufacturer, AKA a cell phone manufacturer, probably typo. Uh, maybe, maybe cell phone uh, size, maybe cell phone color, maybe, you get the idea. This is a piece of data about your cell phone. Maybe type of glass. And so I'm gonna say uh, the first one, am I spelling manufacturer correct? I don't know. Now a manufacturer like Samsung is not an int, obviously we know uh, ints are numbers, but a manufacturer is gonna be a string. 
Okay, so now I've got this property that I could use. Before I had, I had a method that would ring, so now all of my cell phones, okay, what I've done is I've created a template for a cell phone, and it doesn't matter if it's an Apple phone, if it's a Sony phone, if it's uh, uh, OnePlus is the, the phone brand that I have, um, Samsung, not Sony, I was thinking Samsung. All the cell phones in my world play Rihanna music, okay? But the manufacturers can now be different, okay? So the cell phone class can have different manufacturers here. And so if I go back over here to my form, I could say, for example, my cell manufacturer equals one plus. And your cell manufacturer equals Apple. So you could set up all these cell phones to have different pieces of data. And again, the data is stored in properties. Okay. And an event, an event is something like a button click, okay? An event is something that says, okay, whenever this occurrence, whenever this thing happens, whenever you click the button, we need to run some C-sharp code, okay? Um, and you can create custom events. For example, in my cell phone class, um, I could create an event, maybe for dialing 911, like an emergency event. And that in, in my code, if anyone were to dial 911 in my code, then, a, then an event would run in my class to do something, to run a little bit of C-sharp code. Okay, in in my class. Okay, so I'm not really gonna hit events, but I did wanna hit, I wanna show you how you create a property. I wanna show you how you create a method. That's gonna be, um, we're gonna do that a lot more in this class. But an event is another member. So properties, methods, and events are all members of an object or members of a class. This last bullet's important. If you instantiate two or more instances of the same class, all of the objects have the same properties, methods, and events. However, values assigned to the properties can vary from one instance to another. Okay, and that's what I did in my code. Over here, here's one instance of a cell phone. Here's another instance of the cell phone. They both have the same property, the manufacturer property, but the values assigned to the property can, can vary. All right, so quick review try and just throw this in here um, in discord for me someone tell me what an object is what is an object and you could tell me in whatever terms make sense to you you don't have to give me the technical definition what is an object good so a technical definition is an object is an instance of a class which is correct. That's a technical definition. In my example, what was the object? Um, the cookie was the object. That is correct. In my coding demonstration, in my coding demonstration over here, how many objects do I have? I've got two objects. 
what's the identifiers of my objects? What are the identifiers of my objects? My cell and your cell. Those are the identifiers. Okay. That is correct. My cell is the identifier of my first object. Your cell is the identifier of the second object. So then you can give me the technical or the non-technical. What is a class? What is a class? Good. A class is a blueprint of an object. It's a template of an object. Those are both correct answers. In my, in my uh, simplest explanation, what was, my, what was my class? If the cookie was the object, the cookie cutter was the class. Okay? And when I use that cookie cutter to create my objects... Okay, I'm creating instances. Okay, every time I stamp the cookie cutter is a new instance of a class. All right, so uh, that's just terminology. Um, classes, objects, and instances. Okay, good. What are class members? What are class members? There's three members of classes. Methods are one, properties are another, and events are a third. Um, what are methods? What are methods? They are behaviors of the class, yes. In other words, what the class can do. What the class can do. What are properties? Properties are pieces of data about the class. That is correct, right? And then what are events? Events are the hard one, okay? Um, I'm gonna, I, I don't know that I did a good enough job of explaining events, so I'm gonna explain events again. Events are kind of generic because anything can be an event. Anything interesting, anything happens, Anything interesting that happens while the yeah that's a good way of putting it a signal a signal is sent um, that that causes something interesting to happen in code to run. Right, so it's a real generic way. If you like, look at the technical definition of an event. An event is just something interesting that occurs. Well, who who says whether it's interesting? Well, you, the coder, say whether it's interesting. Okay, I'll give you examples of events. Okay, if the object is a button, if the object is a button, something interesting could be that you click that button. That's that's something that occurs while the program is running that you say is interesting, the programmer says is interesting, and you're gonna run code when that happens, okay? If the, button, if the button is the object, a hover could also be an event. You could hover the button. You could mouse over the button, which is kinda like the hover. You can mouse out of the button, right? Um, Maybe you mouse over the button and then 10 seconds go by and that could be an event, right? Something based on time. 
All right. So so those are all those are all just events. Now, events as tied to a button, right? But in my cell phone example, an event could be uh, 911 is called, right? That would be something interesting that would that would initiate some code to call emergency services. And so an event is something like it's hard to define because it's so abstract. It's literally anything that the programmer defines as interesting. It's really abstract. Okay, you guys have done well so far. You're still with me. Let's take our first break this morning. I'm going to pause the recording. And so where we left off uh, on the lecture, uh, they get into talking about a member list in the code editor window. And so here's how you, how to code a member of a class. Okay, so what you do is you start with the identifier. Then a dot, then the name of the member. When I say start with the identifier, the object identifier. Okay, so cell phone is the class the object is your cell. Cell phone is the class. The object is my cell. So we're going to start with my cell. And notice what happens when I start with my cell. You can start with my cell or your cell. My cell dot. And what you see here are class members. Manufacturer is a class member and ring is a class member. You can look at the icons. You can see the wrench represents a property. And this little box represents a method. So these icons, if you want to show only methods, show only properties, okay? Now, I did not code these other methods, equals get type and two string. Okay, these are methods that we get uh, for free, you consider them, and we'll talk about those methods um, a little bit later on. Okay, but the, the things that we coded um, are there. So your cell dot manufacturer, that's a property. And when it's a property, you just put the data right in. Maybe at one point you had a Samsung Right, and then later on, your cell manufacturers change to Apple. You'll notice when I had the property, I put put data in. I use the equal sign to assign the string one plus to the manufacturer property of my cell. All right, so I'm just kind of, I mean, I, this is what I coded. I'm just breaking down the pieces here. And in this case, it's the same thing. Ring is a member that belongs to my cell. And when it rang, I put, let's take a look at this. In this case, label result, label result is much like my cell. Label result is an object. It's an object that's hanging out right here on my form. So these are all objects. The form itself is an object, the button is an object, and the label is an object. And the, and the label has properties, right? So just much like we can code properties over here, uh, all of these things in the toolbox, these are all objects. When we use them, they are objects. And these objects have properties. All right. 
So they were showing you exactly what I just showed you. And typically, typically what you're going to do is object name dot member name. Okay. The text property of a text box called text total and putting the value of 10 in it. Right. The read only property of a text box and assigning it read only to true. Now methods though, methods are members, but keep in mind methods have parentheses. So when I'm looking at this, this looks a whole lot like a property, except it's got parentheses. So when you see parentheses, that should scream, that should scream that's a method. Okay, so, so in this case, back in my code, right here ring now if it didn't have parentheses it wouldn't work okay but if it didn't have parentheses it, it looks a whole lot like manufacturer right but manufacturer is a property so it does not have parentheses ring is a method so it does have properties again methods do something and properties just store information. And then in an event, an event, we kind of have coded right here. This is the click event for our button ring, button. So that says whenever a user does this, whenever a user clicks the button to run the code that's in here. Um, you know, here's pull in another button and call this the close button and name it button close. And you could say this, which refers to the form, this dot close. Now, even as I begin to type this, there's a whole bunch of, now we've got three options. We've got the box, which are our methods. We've got the properties, which are the wrench, and we've got the lightning bolts, which are our events. Okay, but all I'm trying to show you is this dot close. And if I run that and I close, that's a simple way for closing the form this dot close is going to close the uh, the form that you're on there's also a focus event so let's do this let's add a text box one two and three and maybe this is, we'll give them the names, text, first name, click on the second one, text, middle name, third one, text, last name. And just for a demonstration, this will be button focus. It's the name of our middle button there. Focus last name. When we click this button called button focus, txt text last name dot focus. So again, focus is a method that belongs to any text box. So any text box that we've created we name it, we name our text boxes in the properties over here, but then we can access those names in code and give them focus. So when we start it, you'll notice none of these text boxes have focus, but if I click on this button, 
you can see that the cursor jumps to the third text box. So these are built-in methods. Focus is a built-in method that belongs to a lot of controls, not just text boxes. Close is a method that belongs to forms. Okay, Ring is a method that I created that belongs to any cell phone object that you create. Okay, this is just an explanation of what I just covered. Okay. When I use this form designer, what's actually happening is every time I drag a tool on like a drag a button on or or if I move things around what you're getting is a whole lot of code generation that you did not have to write when I when I double click this button and it creates an event there's a whole bunch of code that is written behind the scenes that you don't have to write Okay, so whether you're designing the look of your form or you're working with the events of your controls, all of this has a, uh, a code that's being written for free, you know, or automatically, I should say. In fact, if you go into this formdesigner.cs, you can see that it creates a button on line 121. It creates a button called button ring, right? These are the controls. This is the code for the controls that we drag and dropped. Okay, what you see is what you get. That's called uh, WussyWig. Like WussyWig editing means drag and drop editing to create your controls. And if I expand this little line 24, um, these are a bunch of properties for the location of my button ring. Button ring location is at this location on my form. It has a name property called button ring. It has a size of height and width. It has a tab index. It has a text property. It has a background color. And it has an event on line 49. It has an event. This is wiring up a click to an event called button ring underscore click. Okay, so the, the reason I point this out, okay, and this is all in the form designer. Generally speaking, you don't touch this form designer. Okay, this is the, you could call it the code behind the GUI, right? This is the code behind the GUI. This is, this is the code that we edit right form1.cs but this designer.cs form1.designer.cs we generally don't touch this but let me show you like a common thing that happens um maybe maybe in our designer maybe i accidentally double click this text box see this i accidentally and then you're like oh wait a minute i don't want an event for the text changing of my text box i think i'm just going to delete that Okay, this is very commonly a mistake. And then you go back to your form and it's like broken. Okay, so that was not the correct way. Um, the reason this happens is that your designer, um, the code behind made an event for that click event and it's looking for a method called text last name underscore text changed. So the, the, the code that was automatically generated is looking for this method, and you just deleted that method. Um, and so therefore, it breaks your form. Now, if I put that method back in there, the form comes back. All right, the proper way to delete that, I'll show you, if you go to properties of this text box, you'll notice a little lightning bolt right here for events. 
and you just delete this name right here, just delete that, and then click Save All. And then you can view the code here. Now you can see this has zero references. See like right here it says zero references. This has a reference, one reference, one reference. Okay, but by, by going again on this text box, going into the events, deleting the name right there and clicking save, now the code behind, the auto-generated code, no longer has an event for that, uh, a method for that event. And now if you view the code, now you can delete this and it doesn't break anything, okay? Uh, that's not necessarily part of the chapter. I just wanted to show you that in case you come across that, okay. But uh, this code right here that they're showing you, this, this button exit dot click plus equals new system event handler, that's the auto-generated code. That's just one line of the auto-generated code. Again, if I go back into this, what do we see here is 130 lines of auto-generated code for us. Most of the time, we don't code in here. We don't touch that. That's auto-generated for us based on what we do on this form. All right, clicking is not the only event. Double-clicking, entering, leaving, loading, closing, closed. Closing is just before. I'll give you an, ex an example of what a closing event is. In Microsoft Word, you click the X in the upper right-hand corner. Now closing, it's, it started the process of closing, but typically it's gonna ask you, do you want to save your work? Okay, that prompt that says, do you want to save your work? That is a closing event. It's not, it's not done yet, it's in the process of closing. Closed is what happens after the GUI is out of sight. Closed is, okay, it is now closed. The user can no longer see the GUI. And we need to run some code at that point. Sometimes as well. One second, I got a quick question. Private. Um, um, Okay, now this, if I view the code here, these methods, and they're methods because they have parentheses, they are a specific kind of method called an event handler. And all an event handler is, is a method that runs in response to an event occurring. Okay, so these right here are called event handlers. The button click is an event handler. So you can kind of see it breaks down. Again, an event handler has an object. To the, the convention for an event handler is, the naming convention, I should say, is the name of the object followed by an underscore followed by the event. Okay, covered that, covered that. Um, Visual Studio is pretty smart. It's gonna give you a lot of code help um, for example, over here, I typed in prop tab tab and it auto completed a property. Um, so if I wanted a property, another cell phone property, I could have, um, 
um, serial number. Okay, serial number is an int. And so as we get into here, um, you might have, uh, like you type in if statement, we'll get into writing if statements and you can hit tab, tab, and you get an if. You get like a template for an if statement. For tab, tab, you get a, a template for a for loop. Okay, so as we're learning to write code, uh, a lot of what's built into Visual Studio will give you, uh, if I type in the word try, and this is called a code snippet. Anytime you can press tab, tab, it's called a code snippet, and it'll just kind of give you a template of code um, by hitting tab. So that's a nice feature built into Visual Studio. All right, we are kind of chugging along here. Again, just code completion. That's our event handler. Another event handler. Okay, a couple of C-sharp coding rules. Um, probably the biggest one here is that you end a statement with a semicolon. So um, a lot of learning, for example, learning C-sharp is learning where the semicolons go. So in English, you know, we end a sentence with a period. Uh, in C sharp, we end a, a statement, which is much like a sentence. We end a statement with a semicolon. It's kind of like, again, the equivalent of the English period. Um, you'll notice here on line 47, there's no semicolon at the end. So line 47 is not a statement. Line 49 is a statement. And so learning where the semicolons go is a big part of learning C sharp and code snippets kind of help you with that right so I will tell you I've seen you know students want to put semicolons at the end of an if statement okay but that's not correct it says even t Visual Studio says possibly mistaken empty statement so Visual Studio will even tell you um, so just learning where semicolons go is part of the learning process again the answer to that is they go at the end of statements, um, but learning what a statement is and what a statement is not um, will, will just be part of the learning process. Okay, anytime we've got curly braces, um, you, you also see these called brackets, right? So, um, on line 44, these are your parentheses. I, I typically call these curly braces. Um, there's a, a common editor. Um, no, I'm sorry. Brackets are these guys. Line 48, these are brackets. These are curly braces or curly brackets. I call them curly braces. Okay, so just some common symbols, parentheses, curly braces, and brackets. When you see curly braces, this is often called a block of code. So line 45 is the beginning of the block. Line 47 is the end of the block. All right. Line 21 is the beginning of the block. Line 42 is the end of it. In fact, if you click here, you can kind of see it highlighted in gray. And Visual Studio gives you uh, lines, you know, to help you see the beginning of the block and trace it down to the end of the block. Beginning of the block, trace it down to the end of the block. So I like stacking my curly braces like this, 
vertically so you can see them. That's not always a coding convention. Sometimes, oftentimes, you'll see the starting curly brace right here. Okay. And that kind of saves um, a line. So this is also uh, a convention, which is fine. Okay, but in this class, you're going to see me just keep them uh, vertically stacked like this for readability purposes. All right, chugging along, chugging along. All right, when you write code that is not correct, what they call, there's, there's, different kinds of errors that you can write. But if a program won't run, oftentimes it's like, for example, if I misspelled my cell, um, it'll give you an error. It'll say the name my cell does not exist in the current context um, because I left off an L, okay? My cell with a capital C is different than my cell with a lowercase c. Now, if you get this red squiggly in Visual Studio, that means your code will not run. Uh, if you cannot get your code to a running point, that's considered a syntax error. Okay, a syntax error simply means uh, you're not following the rules of the language. The rules of the language in this case uh, was you have to follow case sensitivity, right? It is case sensitive. Uh, another syntax error is spelling. You have to spell your identifiers correctly. Um, if you misspell the name of the identifier, it won't work. Uh, leaving off a semicolon is a syntax error. Um, it'll even kind of pop up in this error list down here. Whoops. And you can click on it. I click on that link and it'll try and bring you to a uh, search result. Or if you double click it, it'll take you to that line. For example, my, my cursor is on line 42. If I just double click it, it highlights line 37 where we need a, a, a semicolon. Now, there's a, a tool called the compiler. And what's happening is your code, what the compiler does is it looks at your code and it looks for syntax errors. And Visual Studio is so smart, it's basically running the compiler in the background while you're writing your code. And if it sees, if the compiler, which is a piece of Visual Studio, if it sees that you are have a syntax error, you're not following the rules of C-sharp, it's gonna give you an error right away, okay? So your code, uh, it's kind of being compiled as you write it so that if you can get it to a point um, without red squiggly lines, um, that means uh, the compiler did not find any errors and that you should be ready to run it now that's not always it's not always going to work just because you can be free of syntax errors does not mean you don't have other errors okay but basically you've got this tool called the compiler and the compiler is looking for mistakes and it's running all the time and if it finds them it's going to let you know So you can kind of see here that they found syntax errors and these syntax errors, again, are listed in Visual Studio down here in this error list. This should be here by default anytime you're looking at a C-sharp file, a .cs file. You should see this error list window. If that's not there, you could always reset your window layout if you accidentally close it. Okay, you do have a little bit of uh, 
of code style where you put the line breaks and the white space in your code to make it readable. For example, if you look at slide 23 and 24, you could see that you got a decent amount of white space and it's pretty easy to read versus 25. 25 will run. Line 25 will run, but it's not formatted in such a way that it makes it easier for a, a coder to look at or read. Okay, so obviously in this class, we're gonna be formatting our source code, the code that we write. Okay, that's called source code. We're gonna be formatting it in such a way that it's easy to read. If you look at my code, you know, I try and insert line breaks and um, try and make it as easy to read as possible not putting a bunch of statements all, all on one line and um, so if you look here you can you know see that's a lot harder to read so every time you're within a block of code you'll notice I indent so here's a block of code and I've got a tab indenting all of my code inside of there so every new block of code I add another layer of indenting Right, so that's one way that we make our code easy to read. Um, we're using spaces and line breaks uh, in appropriate places. I'll help you write. Um, you know, if you kind of mimic me, um, that'll be your best bet for, um, you know, learning to write easy to read code. Um, you'll see here I write comments that kind of help you. I try and help you understand these different pieces. Um, a, a single line comment is done with two slashes. However, you can do multi-line comments. Like this. This is a multi-line comment. In fact, you don't even need these stars. Okay, so if you don't want to put a bunch of forward slashes, like here's, you know, eight forward slashes, you could just do forward slash star, star forward slash. It's pretty common at the start of your program, so go ahead and put your name, the name of your program, maybe a description, a date that you wrote it, the last edit, now this, Maybe a little paragraph of what's going on. So kind of up at the top, up here, if you want to put a multi-line comment describing your program, that's, that's a good practice to get into. So single line comments and multi-line comments. Now, a little bit more about comments. You know, comments are... Comments are for documentation. Um, if you write a bit of code that's complex, um, and then you don't see that code for like six months, you're probably not gonna remember why you coded the code that way. And so, there for documentation for other developers to look at your code and understand but it's also documentation is important for you if you come back to your own code six months later you know you might want to understand why you wrote it the way you wrote it especially if it's a complex piece of code um and so, you know, um, I've, you know, shown you how to document or how to comment. I've said why we do it. Uh, and I guess the last piece there is to explain that if you're working for a medium to large size company um, documenting is part of the development process that takes a lot of time I mean clear good documentation 
for developers and for end users, right? How, how should your end users use your program? Now comments, here's, here's something else. Comments are ignored by the compiler. In other words, you know, they're not, they're not trying to look for syntax errors. The compiler is not looking for errors in your comments. Um, uh, comments are also ignored when your program is running. Right? Comments are just not paid attention to during the execution of uh, your program. So, ah, here's another way comments are used. Comments are also used, I'll even say commonly, when troubleshooting. Okay, so if, if this line of code was aired out, like, uh, who's doing this? And you couldn't you couldn't solve it and you, you weren't sure why and you wanted to see if the rest of your program was working besides this one line you could just throw a comment right here temporarily and run run the program and see if the other things are working in your program um and then bring it back later on um, so oftentimes comments are used to try and, or maybe you're not even sure where, maybe you knew the problem is in this, this entire line, uh, block of code, right? Between 20 and 49, you're not sure where the problem exists. You could highlight this whole thing, come up here, comment it all out. You know, so it puts single line breaks on all of them or single comments on all of them. And now you don't have to worry about any of the code in here being the problem because it's all commented out. Okay, so it's used as a like trying to figure out is this is this breaking my program like between these lines of code, all right? So it's it's also used for troubleshooting. So I showed you how to use those comment buttons. I showed you how to expand and collapse regions of code. Again, just to kind of come back in here, um, you see these little tools over here to expand and collapse regions of code. For example, from line 24 to 120, it's a whole block of code, or what they call a region. And you define a region with this pound symbol region. And then there's an end region. So by adding this region, you make this little collapsible block of code that can simplify when you're looking at your code. Um, in mine, you know, for example, this ring automatically, your methods automatically expand and collapse. Your comments can expand and collapse. Your class can expand and collapse. So just getting a little bit familiar with Visual Studio. Let's see, I'm trying to wrap this up. Lecture's coming to an end, folks. Hang in there, we're almost done. You can click on My Cell and it'll highlight all of the times that you code My Cell. Just by clicking on it, it's gonna highlight it in gray. Showed you code snippets, showed you code snippets. I showed you how to rename a variable before. I'll do it again. Um, for example, if my cell, you say, ah, I want a, I want a better identifier. You can right click, instead of like retyping it in one, two, three places, maybe even more, uh, you can use this rename function. So let's rename my cell. We'll call this my 2021 cell. So that's my cell for that year. And it says rename will update three references. I'm going to click apply. So now it updates it in all three places. Uh, 
Um, Visual Studio, like all Microsoft products, are going to give you an online helper. Uh, pressing F1 will get you there. Um, but you have a teacher, so you don't really necessarily need an online helper for labs. Uh, I'm here to help you with that. All right, there are other kinds of errors. Um, I, I mentioned syntax errors being when you don't write or you don't follow the rules of the language. You can get a syntax error, which is a red squiggly. But sometimes the program is running and the program crashes. And when the program crashes, you get a little error like this called format exception was unhandled. You get this little error box that pops up. Um, that can tell you a little bit about errors that occur during the program execution when it's running. Okay, and then the last thing is actually testing a project. So when you run, you can get your program to a running state. Um, you want to test the project to try and break it. And, and the reason that's beneficial to try and break it is because you know your end users are going to use this form in every way possible. They're going to give you good data. They're going to give you bad data. They're going to give you, you know, if this is your username, they might put their password in there instead. Um, so you want to try and basically uh, test, well, it's called testing. You want to try and break your program uh, to find bugs because that's what your end users will do. And so testing is a process in, in software development um, where you test it with good data input and you test it with bad data input or bad da uh, end user interactions because they will, um, they will try and use your program in every way possible. Finally, li last slide, li slide 43, and then we're done here. Um, Part of troubleshooting is to say, ah, I think I got a problem with line 24. Okay, over here, then you can troubleshoot line 24 when your program is running by inserting a breakpoint. Okay, so in this in this gray margin, um, this is as we go through this class, you're going to be using breakpoints to fix problems that you come across. Okay, so you click in this little margin over here. And then you hit debug, start with debugging, or just hit F5. And what that's going to do, it's going to run your software in what's uh, uh, debugging mode. And when I click this button, you'll notice that the program actually stops. It doesn't run the line 24. And then I have these tools to kind of execute my program line by line. to watch the program executing as it goes through. Okay, so just as an introduction uh, to breakpoints, um, we'll put that in there. All right, folks, uh, we're gonna finish this up with some review questions and then we're gonna take a break and then we're gonna come back and get started on our labs together, okay? So let's try and bring back some questions here to get some interaction going on. What's it called? So here's my first question for the class, if you guys kinda of zone back in for me. The answer to this is in is right on the slide, but what's it called when you write your code in easy to read method versus an difficult to read method? That's called your programming, and it's right in the title. It's not the documentation. Documentation is the, the comments. It's your coding, starts with an S. It's right there in the title, yeah, in the title. Yeah, the coding style. So if you have a good coding style, your code is easy to read. If you have a bad coding style, it's hard to read. 
I mean, think of your fashion, right? You got good fashion, you've got good style, you got bad fashion, you got bad style, okay? Um, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit more subjective, like good fashion is a little bit more subjective, but in coding, um, it's let, there's some definite things you can do that are not subjective to give you good readable style. So, so what are some of the things that we can do for good style that are not subjective um, to give us good readable style? Like what, do, what are the things that are important here? Okay, adding line breaks um, after statements and after uh, blocks of code. What else can we do? All right, good, yeah, indent everything inside of a code block. So notice how we've got a code block on this if statement and we're indenting inside of it. Yeah, align the curly braces uh, either vertically or um, if they're not gonna be right on top of one another, um, another common convention is that the opening curly brace is right after the parenthesis of the method, and then it closes there. Okay, so what are, how, how do we do a multi-line comment? How would we do a multi-line comment in C Sharp? Okay, Zach typed the opening one, which is forward slash star, and then how would you close that? Star forward slash, yep, you guys got it. Why do we use comments? Why do we use comments? Documentation is the number one answer. Why else do we use comments? Troubleshooting is a great answer. Who do we document for? Who do we document for? Our future selves, for our coworkers when we're working on teams, for end users who are going to use your application. So the, the comments inside of the source code, those are, the comments inside of the source code, those are for yourself and for your team members. But there, there's also documentation that's more public facing documentation that might go on a website or they might go in like a, um, you know, user's guide for your software. Really good software uh, is intuitive and doesn't need instructions on how to use it. For example, you know, that's what Apple is known for and it had building intuitive software that users don't need to read a giant tutorial on how to use an iPhone. They, they can just kind of pick it up and like a four-year-old can just kind of pick up an iPhone and uh, use it because it's intuitive. Good answers. True or false, C-sharp is case sensitive. It is true. What's it called when Visual Studio uh, will complete a, a code chunk for you? By When you press tab tab, what's that called? Yeah, IntelliSense is the the like it's uh, filling in the code, like it's trying to see what you're typing and trying to make suggestions. So IntelliSense is trying to help you finish write your code, and 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 IntelliSense is all the suggestions that Visual Studio gives you. But I guess a feature of IntelliSense is when 
you start writing some code and then you can hit tab twice and it'll fill in like a code chunk for you. Let's see here. If I type in if, see this term right here. called a code snippet it's called a code snippet and if I just even double let's see if I thought I could double click it but I always hit tab tab if tab tab and then it puts in this little chunk of code for me it's called a code snippet All right, um, these symbols right here, these are called, what are these symbols called? I'm okay with awkward silences. Yep, Josh got it. Those are our parentheses. You know, I guess developers, you know, couldn't be bothered with the full word parentheses and they call them parens for short because they couldn't be bothered to they're common enough when you see parentheses that's that's the symbol that represents what kind of member when you see parentheses you know what kind what kind of member is that it's a method that is correct. And when I say member, what do members belong to? Members belong to what? It's a member of what? A member of a class. That is correct. What are these symbols? On line 50, I've highlighted on line 50. Curly braces, all right. And these guys, 49 brackets. What's another name for the equal symbol? The equal symbol in programming is also called the what? It is an operator, an operator, that is, it, it is an operator. The plus is an operator, the equals an operator, minus is an operator. But it has, uh, logical operators are like less than or, e you know, less than, greater than, um, more specifically, it's called the assignment operator. The assignment operator. Because what you're doing here is you're assigning the value of Apple into the manufacturer of your cell phone. So what's changing is on the left and the, the value that you're assigning to it is on the right. So the equal sign is also called the assignment operator.
What is a break point? What is a break point? Yeah, it's a way to stop your code while, you know, while the program is executing. You can you can stop it from running. And what do we use breakpoints for? We use breakpoints for troubleshooting. So we've actually before we've even learned to write much code, we know that we could use breakpoints for troubleshooting and we know we can use comments for troubleshooting. Which are which are both two very commonly used troubleshooting techniques. There's this window right here called the exception assistant. And what's this window all about? It kind of says up in the title there. But what's this what's this window? The exception assistant, what's that all about? Yeah, it's a runtime error. So like uh, your your program is running and it crashes, it's gonna try and give you this window to tell you a little bit about why it crashed. Okay, so the exception assistant is there to help you, to assist you in finding a an error in your program. And this particular error occurs when your program is running. Now what other kind of errors are there besides runtime that we learned about? Syntax. And how do we know when we have a syntax error? Yeah, it won't run. The red line will be a red squiggly line. And what tool puts that red squiggly line there? It's built into Visual Studio. Yeah, that tool is called the compiler. You know, when I learned uh, my first programming language, you know, visual, you know, uh, I didn't use Visual Studio. I used a different tool. And I had to compile my code first. And so I actually had to, you know, run this process called, you know, run compile. And then it would tell me my error messages. And kind of a, so in the early days of coding, this is really cool. So, uh, you know, I'm a, um, a student of, you know, Bill Gates. I think Bill Gates is a really smart man. Um, you know, and he talked about in the early days of inventing Microsoft and in the early days of Bill Gates learning to write software. Okay, so compilers are tools that tell you the mistakes, the syntax mistakes that you have. In the early days of learning to write software, okay, um, compilers were essentially machines that were shared amongst an entire class. So imagine every one of you, you only had one compiler to work for. So what you would do as a, as a student of learning computer science is you would write some code and you would submit it at the end of class to be compiled and basically, you know, look for errors, okay? It would take then days to compile everyone's work. And so you would submit your code looking for mistakes, looking for syntax mistakes, and it would take days um, to get that back. And one of Bill Gates' early advantages um, was that he essentially had access um, to a very fast compiler that it did not take so long for the results to compile. So any one of you, you know, it might take, I don't, I don't know how long, let's just say it would take 12 hours to compile your code. Okay, so Zach, you know, submits his work to me to be compiled, and just for Zach, it would take 12 hours. Well, Bill Gates had access to a high-end compiler that would return his results, like, almost immediately, kind of like Visual Studio does. Um, and it was almost like private access, because he had access, you know, he was this really smart math guy, and he got started writing code young, so he, he got access to this compiler that was at the university 
um, where basically him and a few friends had very exclusive access to a high-end compiler that no one else had access to. Um, so Bill Gates is a genius, uh, and Bill Gates is extremely hardworking, but he also had access to some tools at the time that not a lot of developers had access to, um, which is that of a high-end compiler. Nowadays, it's just all built into Visual Studio, and you don't even know that it's there, right? But but it's a definitely an important tool that uh, uh, played a role into Bill Gates' success. All right, guys. That's the end of the lecture. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Good work. You paid attention. You learned. <laughs>